Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us. We'll kick this off now. A famous man once said that the tradition of all dead generations weighs on the minds of the living like a nightmare. Today, it's perhaps the case that the opposite is true. We hear increasing talk of the future as a dark, mysterious, perhaps dangerous place where what's likely to happen is mass extinction of insects or plants or, of course, people that we will be if we want to survive, left to eating bugs um, or cut or at the very least radically changing our lifestyles. From these political pronouncements right through to some of our cultural and media products, apocalyptic visions seem to be the order of the day. I don't say this to uh, sort of set a gloomy tone for a Sunday afternoon after a long weekend of discussion, but to try and set the stakes a little bit for the discussion today, extinction or progress visions of the future. It seems to me that it's uh, increasingly important for us to get to grips with our relationship to the future, not least because um, what we should do or not do to tackle the threat of uh, climate change or, depending on you speak to, a climate breakdown or a climate extinction seems to be one of the most important pressing political concerns of our time, the demonstrated by the sort of sporadic but seemingly never-ending series of demonstrations uh, in cities across the world, and anybody who's been in London will know just this too. Even when people, I think, make, as we point out in the blurb, there are often uh, attempts to people to harness new technologies or to talk about the possibilities of the future to, say, create a more egalitarian, uh, equal society. Even those same people see, find it hard to not mention those technologies such as artificial intelligence or robotics without also adding that, of course, this will lead to uh, mass joblessness uh, and will have to introduce some sort of universal basic income or what have you to deal with the negative effects of these, of these technologies. Of course, perhaps what's lost in some of that is a more positive relationship to the future or perhaps the scale of the problems that we're facing justify such uh, stark pronouncements. So we're going to be trying to dig into all of this and to uh, how we think of and relate to the future. And to do that, I've got a really wonderful panel uh, with me to help. I am Jacob Reynolds. I'm the Partnerships Manager at the Academy of Ideas, uh, responsible in part for putting on the festival and for pulling together these series of keynotes, which I'm delighted to be chairing. So I want to introduce my panel in the order that they're going to speak. So Speaking on my far right is Gregory Clace, who's Professor of History at Royal Holloway University of London and author, uh, importantly for today, of Searching for Utopia, the History of an Idea. He's also a fellow at the RSA. Um, we're really, really glad to have uh, Greg with us. So can we welcome him? Uh, speaking uh, next, on my immediate right, is Dr. Ashley Frawley, who's a senior lecturer in sociology and social policy at Swansea University. She, um, at least if my Twitter feed is anything to go by, is also an increasing commentator uh, across uh, the media and on places like Sky News. She's the author of um, Semiotics of Happiness. I always like it when someone I know publishes a book and I have to Google what a word means, so I learned what semiotics means. Um, and also, more recently forthcoming, will be Significant Emotions. Um, uh, Ashley has been a regular contributor for the Battle of Ideas, uh, always an extremely insightful and provocative voice, and so I'm very glad to have Ashley on this panel. Please welcome her. <laughs> Speaking next uh, is Dr. Shara Ali, who's the Home Affairs spokesperson and former deputy leader of the Green Party, uh, the author of Why Vote Green uh, 2015. Um, and a, a likewise, uh, a sort of stalwart of the Battle of Ideas Festival, always helping us to uh, try and live the ambition we have at the Battle of Ideas Festival of bringing together genuinely uh, intellectually diverse uh, panels, but to argue about important issues in, in good faith, even if we come across from different sides of the political divide. I'm really glad to be joined by Sharon. Uh, speaking last will be Brendan O'Neill, who's the <coughs> editor of uh, Spiked, the online magazine many of you will have heard of. Uh, he's the host of the Brendan O'Neill Show. He's written uh, in The Sun and writes regularly for The Spectator, and he's the author of a collection of great essays called Duty to Offend. I'm really, really uh, glad to be joined by Brendan. Can we give him a warm welcome? 
So it should be obvious uh, now how these sessions are running, but the panel will have five to seven minutes to lay out their opening remarks. I'll be as strict as I can be um, with ensuring they keep to the time, and then we will be opening out very much as much as we can for uh, the audience to get involved. It was certainly the case in the last keynote, if you were here, that as great as the panel was, it was the audience that 100% brought it to life, and I'm expecting the same of you uh, again today. So um, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Greg, who will give us his uh, first thoughts. Thank you very much for coming, all of you. First the problem, then the solution. The problem, pretty obviously, for anyone who's followed the debate about climate change since Rio 1992 to Paris 2015, is that we've embraced a very comfortable narrative. We could attain and perhaps live with 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius warming. The summer holidays would be a little bit hotter, but it wouldn't imperil the human race to any degree. Up till about 2015-16, this was the dominant narrative, the comfort zone of all such discussions about the subject. Then very dramatically and very radically, the statistics started to come in from all quarters, which indicated a very different course and very different prospect for humanity. The worst case scenarios of the late 1990s and turn of the century indicated that not two degrees, but something like three and a half to four, five, even six were possible. By 2017, it was fairly obvious that the middle range here, that is to say four degrees, was now extremely likely and would come much faster, at least a half a century more rapidly than had been anticipated in the late 90s, turn of the century. The upper range still remains, and all of the worst case scenarios from that period, mid 90s to about 2005, now turn out to be coming true. The Paris Agreement of 2015, of course, which will not be adhered to, would still have brought about around 3.2 degrees Celsius warming. We now know, however, that the rate of warming varies enormously. There's a global average of about 1.1 to 1.2 degrees. In the Arctic and the Antarctic, some four to five times as high. The likelihood now, then, is around 2050, but excuse the phrase, the shit will start to hit the fan well before then, we should envision temperature rise of approximately four degrees Celsius, possibly a little sooner than that as well, since all of the preceding estimates have been under estimates. So what do we do about this? We are indeed headed for the probable extinction, not of all humanity, but a very substantial portion. The estimate now is that between 500 million and a billion people can survive the planet uh, at temperatures of four degrees Celsius. Above that, the numbers decline in turn. So the solution in three or four minutes, approximately a 10 point plan, starting obviously with energy. All fossil fuels stay immediately in the ground as of the day that we make this decision. Coal in particular, oil after that, natural gas. Secondly, the most immediate fix is reforestation. We need to replant about 1.5 trillion trees. It can be done. It needs to be done within 10 years, which is the horizon for the entire framework I'm producing here. Thirdly, we need to consider how to manage our food supply. We will require, at current rates of population growth, approximately 50% more food by 2050. We will have approximately 50% less food than we now have. Draw your own conclusion. Fourthly, we need, obviously, to avoid waste and recycle everything possible. This includes an end to conspicuous consumption of all kinds, which leads me to the next point, the restraint of demand. Progress, which has brought us from around 1750 or so to our modern magnified indulgence in luxury and to what we generally term consumer society, has to come to a halt. Then a much vexed issue, population control. The world's population now is around about 7.7 .7 billion. We can sustain perhaps 5 billion we would be wise to try to do this rationally rather than having nature do it for us. Then there's the question of work. Uh, as
as was indicated in the introduction, there have been many and lengthy discussions about this question about uh, particularly the reduction of the working week. This can also be accomplished. We do not want, however, to see our leisure time transformed into additional consumption time. Then there's the issue of a public service ethos. Clearly, the future post-consumer society, some would say post-capitalism as well, will demand a much greater attention to and concern with the environment. I would favor, as a number of other people do, uh, a national kind of institution of public service lasting perhaps a year or two uh, in one's youth where tree planting and so on was a fundamental part of uh, the dedicated environment. Then there's the question of wealth and inequality. Uh, going back again to the 18th century, it's fairly obvious that the massive inequality which already began to exhibit itself then, which of course since 2008 has become uh, very greatly magnified, needs to come to an end. Uh, you will have seen some of the debates recently in the last few days about abolishing the class of billionaires. An excellent idea and a good place to start as well. Uh, and then finally, but there's a lot uh, else obviously that I'd want to talk to. There's the question of the renewal of our cities. The traditional utopian response to urban evils from well before the beginning of consumer society is to retreat back to the countryside to a lifestyle which is simpler, closer to nature, and so on. I don't think is a viable alternative in the 21st century. I think we have to remake our cities. Uh, it's quite obvious that we'll have to live in cities where if temperatures are at four degrees or above, a lot of the time is going to be spent underground, and all of the superstructure, uh, electricity, and so on, will have to be completely renewed. Thanks very much. Thanks for that, uh, Greg. I'll hand over to Ashley for her opening thoughts. Okay, so looking at the, the, the title of this session, I think you can learn a lot about a culture from understanding its cultural forms, the way that it talks about itself in fiction, hence semiotics, I know. Um, so you can learn a lot about a culture from looking at the way that we fictionalize the future. So if you look at... Um, future, you know, films set in the future or, or um, TV set in the future in the past, um, you had, it was always just kind of assumed that by the time we get to this point in the future, we'll have solved all these problems, right? So you look at um, Star Trek, you know, there's no, uh, they've got money, but it doesn't really make sense because they've got matter machines. And it's just kind of assumed when we get to this point, we'll have solved all these problems, we'll have left that behind us, and then the limit is, you know, the stars, you know, there's no limits to what human beings can do. And now when you look at our future-oriented films, it's all apocalypse, post-apocalypse, dystopia. And I think it's a bit disturbing too that I've been noticing in films set in the future, even when we're sort of exploring space, all the problems of the present are still with us. And in fact, um, they're the reason why we're exploring space or doing whatever. They're the premise. You know, these, we've not been able to escape these issues and we're however far into the future and they're still there and that's, you know, our planet is uh, exhausted and all that sort of thing. And so we, we just, we've lost this idea that things will go from the way they are to something better and it's always just assumed things go from bad to worse. And so we can learn a lot about what our vision of human action from fiction, but we can also learn a lot about our relationship to social problems and what we believe the problems are by looking at even our, our, our present day um, fiction so, or uh, our films and cultural forms. So if you look at, uh, for instance, Dracula, you could see this as, oh, not present day, this is the past, right? But uh, so in the, uh, the end of the 19th century, you look at Dracula, you could read that as, uh, as a metaphor for like the capitalist who like lives off of the, the lifeblood of the poor, or more likely that it has very aristocratic connotations, right? So it's the feudal lord sucking the lifeblood of the peasants. And then you've, you've got Frankenstein, a metaphor for human scientific achievement that turns around and starts to control us. And now what's the metaphor? What's the, um, the monster of today? Does anyone know? Zombies, right? <laughs> this idea of this mass of unthinking people who, will, who are attacking, they're, they're driven by their lizard brain, slowly, slowly coming for the last people who think. You know, and, and that's really, I think, a metaphor for how we now think about the problems that face us. In the past, we could kind of name 
maybe an enemy, some, something that we could project onto. It was like an, an individual. Or it was something like the machine that turns around and controls us, human activity. But now it's just humanity itself, this mass, this unthinking throng uh, uh, that, that's attacking us. So how did we get to this? And, and, and I think that's, that's a really damaging and dangerous kind of vision. If you think about the idea that in the 20th century, the, the defining moment was the, the Holocaust, you know? And that we could actually be talking about human beings in this way, and in, in the way that it would be great if there were less of us. Obviously, we can't kill anybody. Huh? But if you would just stop having babies, that'd be great. And this, this idea of like seeing human beings as the source of problems is really dangerous and can lead us in really dangerous directions. So how did we get to this point? How am I doing for time? Okay, um, so if you, if you look at the sort of the enlightenment birth of the, the rational human subject, the human being is being capable of reason and thus capable of freedom. Um, that was really, really powerful and, and revolutionary for its time. But what happened was it came about at a time where there were limitations put on that freedom. So capitalism makes us freer than we've ever been, but we're not fully free, right? Like imagine if you had a matter machine like in Star Trek, what your life would be like, you know, if you didn't have to waste so much of your life reproducing your existence. We can see that, you know, capitalism kind of creates that every day. And there were, you know, liberals writing in the 19th century, you know, who said, Look, I'm going to start from the same point that you are, John Locke, uh, the rational, free-willing subject. And, I, and if we look out into the world, I don't see that really existing because we have an economic base that holds that back. And so if we really want to have human freedom, we need to take those progressive things, the things that human beings are creating every day, and, uh, and, and see how we can free them from the destructiveness and the unfreedom of capitalism. Of course, I'm alluding to Karl Marx, right? So in Grindrisse, he talks about, um, at, at some point, the, the human beings stop being appendages of the machines, and we start, start being the watchmen of the machines. The machines become our slaves. And when we no longer have to toil to reproduce our existence, then human history begins. We can make history in the full light of human reason. Well, that's gone. <laughs> we don't believe in that anymore. Human reason is now problematized. We don't really believe. We, we have all these ideas, like, I had somebody come into my office the other day, I'm like the token sociologist, and somebody comes and says, Ashley, I want a sociological perspective on this study that I'm doing. I want to do study, a study that shows Brexit voters have poor impulse control. And there's so much wrong with that. Uh, and so we have this, just this hunger for all these ideas that just prove that, no, look, the source of these problems isn't out there in, in the structure, it's, it's us. It's you and me, we're driven by these impulses and so on. And when you have that kind of narrative for human action, it becomes impossible to think about human beings as a progressive force, as something that can actually think about our problems and through the full, you know, in the full light of reason, actually consciously direct history. It's all about pulling back. And, uh, and, and it seems to me that this whole, the whole liberal project that was initiated in the 18th century has kind of collapsed. And all that we have is, a sort of lefty version or a righty version of what was what were once very sort of regressive ideas, uh, which is the sort of right wing after the French Revolution. And what what became of those ideas uh, in the 20th century? You know, this idea of you know the the Enlightenment was a mistake and so on. That led us down some really terrifying routes. But the difference was at that time there was something that was there that could push back against it. You know, so you had Nazism that was very and, and fascism that were very romantic, very reactionary, very backward looking tried to ape the language of, of uh, socialism and so on. But you had people like you know, Trotsky writing against this and saying, you know, mocking national socialism and reaffirming socialism that has a strong vision of the human subject that was humanist um, at, at, at its heart. And now there's just nothing pushing back against that. And this really anti-humanist vision is just accepted as really progressive and really radical. Um, and so I think what we need to do, what we must do, is return to a strong vision of the human subject that's capable of reason and rationality, capable of taking hold of the future and rationally direct directing it for the, for the end of human freedom as, a, as an uncomprom uh, uncompromising goal. Great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, Thank you, Jacob, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. I want to uh, just touch on a few aspects that uh, occurred to me in looking at the, the theme for today, and I think one 
aspect which I'd definitely like to bring out by the end of my seven minutes to do with the use or abuse of technology. Um, and for sure, uh, I mean, I'm accepting, and I hope many of you will accept the science with respect to the impending catastrophe, you may wish to call it, of business as usual, if the human race carries on overconsumption like there's no tomorrow, what will happen? We can quibble, of course, about the details, whether it's a matter of 10, 20, 30 decades, or some might say there's already a lag in the system and it's already too late. In fact, I was in um, London's living room about 15 years ago chairing a meeting with uh, the then mayor, Ken Livingstone, and he was asked the question, um, what are we going to do about climate change? And he said, it's too late. So even at that point, people were concerned about it, details type of politicians who had probably reflected on it. And I'm wondering whether it wasn't so much about the scale of the challenge and the worry that he or others may have had at that time, but some ideas and thoughts about human nature. And that's what I want to weave in as well, our relationship, if you like, to technology. So given that um, a lot of the, the problems that we encounter in terms of fossil fuel use and the overuse of technology have actually resulted in a huge increase um, in climate degradation, not just in terms of biospecies reduction, but also in the prospect of what look on the surface to be quite small degree C temperatures. But we're dealing with a finely attuned, very balanced <coughs> ecosystem, which has resulted, of course, in human beings, homo sapiens, being able to live on this planet. And Small things that we do, including degree changes to the environment, are going to have potentially devastating consequences upon us. So why is it then, why is it that environmentalists in particular are sometimes considered to be unfriendly towards technology? Is it because we tend to want to attribute the cause of many of our challenges to the overuse or unreflective use of technology. Well, I think that's true to some extent, but I think it would be unfair to categorically suppose that environmentalists, simply because they may be skeptical or questioning of the use of technology, aren't in themselves very scientific. In fact, I would say that, um, speaking from my own experience, somebody who uh, started life as a biotechnologist and was drawn towards philosophy because I was very concerned and preoccupied about the lack of reflection on the ethics of uses of biotechnology in particular, I would say that environmentalists are on the face of it very scientific. They choose to uh, adopt what the science tells them and they're very interested in truth and objectivity. So it isn't the case then that by dint of being concerned about our continued trajectory if it goes uncorrected or unchecked, that we don't, environmentalists, and I count myself as one, don't actually believe that there may not be some technological solution, perhaps um, on the horizon, to offer. But I would want to urge caution with respect to that. It isn't to do necessarily with um, a lack of confidence in human ingenuity. Uh, to the contrary, it's simply a concern that when we, um, we often hear about uh, people being excited about scientific developments, that excitement um, can be misplaced. And what we do need to get uh, better about in our legislation and in our regulations is to reflect and to consider before we move towards um, technical advances what the overall impact would be, not just on ourselves and our self-conceptions of ourselves, but on future generations too. Um, and um, as, uh, sorry, Ashley has remarked upon, she mentioned John Locke, and John Locke um, some centuries ago talked about leaving as much and as good for the next generation. And this is something which has become um, totally ignored in our politics of the day. We're entering a general election, of course, and people are going to be talking about a very short-term electoral cycle. They aren't going to be talking about, if you're lucky, um, your children and your children's children, they aren't going to be talking about generations 100 years into the future. And for sure, 100 years ago, I think we would have found it very difficult to really imagine what kind of society we would be inheriting today. It's very difficult to kind of predict exactly how much man-made objects we're going to be surrounded by and how they're going to affect the way in which we see ourselves situatedly in the environment. So I would suggest to you that um, it, is, it is very difficult for us to actually leave as, as much and as good for the next generation, partly because of a failure in imagination about what kind of people are, there are going to be in the future. So on the one hand, our relationship with technology now is one which I would describe as dysfunctional. 
The difficulty is that the way in which um, technology is engineered, it could, uh, you must be familiar with the concept of inbuilt redundancy, for example, where you know, we, we, we see every, every few months um, large queues outside uh, iPhone stores for the latest generation of software or hardware. That surely is a, a dysfunction that we have towards wanting stuff, which probably we don't really need. And in our better moments, I think we would recognize that our relationship to technology is at risk of taking us over in a way in which it doesn't really empower us at all. It actually disempowers us. And I think one of the best critics of this was Marx, actually. I don't necessarily regard myself as a Marxist. I just pull quotes from anywhere and everywhere. But Marx once said that the more you find value in external things, the less you find value in yourself. And I think there's something very insightful there about our relationship to um, stuff, right? our desire to want things, our desire to want to accumulate. And even um, looking to UK attitude surveys, for example, where people are asked um, whether they have as much as they want or they need, it is found that the more you earn, the more you find, or the more you think that you can't afford what it is that you really need. But it can't be the case, can it, that you don't actually have more stuff. What's happening there is that an ever-increasing level of insatiable desires, which make it more difficult for you to acquire those things, which somehow you've been convinced to think that you need more of. So the solution to this, ultimately, I think it comes within us. Um, for sure, it's a, a very challenging environment. It's especially difficult, I think, looking back at history and seeing what things people have overcome. And there has been progress. There's been moral progress in terms of human rights canons. Um, there's also been technological progress and people being taken out of poverty in a very real sense. But what, how are we actually going to tackle this challenge that's facing us now? I believe that existential emergency is something which we only, uniquely, this generation is facing. And that's what we're going to find especially difficult to overcome if we really believe that all that's required is some fix, technological fix, that's going to allow us to have our cake and eat it. And I don't think that business as usual is really going to um, give us the answers that we need. And finally, final sentence. What we're, what we're not, what environmentalists, the good ones, even Extinction Rebellion, are not, is they're not alarmist. They're actually objective. What they may be saying may be very alarming, but there's a difference. And once we realize that the quality of our life will not only deteriorate immeasurably, but that there's something more important even than stuff, which is breathable air, perhaps we'll be jolted out of inaction. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> now, our final opening thought, uh, Brendan. Thank you. One of my favorite political events this year was the Battle of Canning Town, which was, this was when someone at Extinction Rebellion had the harebrained idea to send their painfully middle-class protesters to Canning Town at 7.30 in the morning to lecture people who were just trying to get to work. And, you know, what could go wrong? Well, it turns out quite a lot could go wrong. It was a mini revolt. There was a rebellion against Extinction Rebellion from largely working class people. And there were so many good moments in the Battle of Canning Town. I loved the commuter who said to one of the pro who called one of the protesters a ponytailed weirdo and asked <laughs> and asked if his mum would be proud of him. The sad thing being she probably is. Um, others were pointing out in, in the rest of the tube system on this day when Extinction Rebellion occupied the tube system, others other uh, re re uh, rebels against Extinction Rebellion were pointing out that the tube system is electric and therefore it's pretty eco-friendly. And then one of the guys said, are you that stupid that you don't understand that this is an eco-friendly transport system? No wonder you can't get jobs. So there was, um, <laughs> there was really interesting pushback. My favorite moment of all of this was at Canning Town itself, when halfway through this melee between ordinary people and these eco-elitists, um, one of the women in this crowd of commuters, really early in the morning, just shouted out, you're lying, the world is not coming to an end. And I thought, there you go, that's the voice of reason. That's the voice of reason juxtaposed against the hysteria of the modern environmentalist movement. 
And the reason it was such an important moment, this Battle of Canning Town, is because that kind of thing just doesn't happen often anymore. The Green Movement increasingly doesn't come into contact with alternative ways of thinking, with reasoned ways of thinking. And it, the reason it doesn't come into contact with that stuff is because it's been very self-consciously cushioned from that kind of engagement. It's been very self-consciously cushioned from any contact or conflict with reason and with an alternative way of understanding the problems facing humanity. Um, and this was uh, the, the thing that strikes me most, uh, the reason I was thinking about this, the way in which the environmentalist movement becomes more unhinged, the more it's protected and cushioned from everyday discussion and reasoned uh, 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 rebellion or criticism, I was thinking about this in relation to Extinction Rebellion more broadly, because the striking thing about Extinction Rebellion is that its very name is a lie. Both words. Extinction is a lie because humanity is not going extinct. And anyone, here we go, anyone, and anyone who says, see you later, anyone who says that humanity is going extinct is a liar and the kind of person who can't even handle, and, and they're the kind, see, this is the kind of person who's been cushioned so much from a recent debate, he can't even handle it, he has to go off and cry in the toilet. Um, so extinction, rebellion, the, 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 two, the two words are a lie. Humanity is not going to become extinct, and it's not a rebellion. It's not a rebellion because it is entirely in keeping with the utterly mainstream political, moral, religious view about the destructive nature of humankind and the fragile nature of nature. This is not a rebellious idea. So extinction rebellion, it's, those two words are untrue. And the other striking thing about Extinction Rebellion is it really speaks to the fact that the more, as I say, the more that environmentalist thinking is protected from everyday discussion, the stranger and more unhinged it becomes. This is what censorship does. This is what happens when you say that anyone who criticizes the ideology of climate change is a climate change denier who must be expelled from the public sphere and must be silenced. Censorship is the midwife of stupidity. Because if you protect your way of thinking from any kind of confrontation or challenge, you become dogmatic, you become unthinking, you start to believe things simply because you know they are true rather than because you have tested them in the public sphere of everyday discussion and everyday debate, and Extinction Rebellion is the end result of that. What we've seen with the Green Movement in recent years is a shift from the idea of global warming to the idea of climate change, to the idea of climate emergency, to the idea of climate breakdown, to the idea of climate catastrophe. Now, either humanity has gone very, very far downhill in the space of 10 or 20 years, or the Green Movement has become so uh, cushioned and cut off from confrontation that it has lost the plot. And I would venture that it, the second uh, argument is truer. What we have in Extinction Rebellion is really the militant wing of capitalist society's loss of faith in itself. This is not a rebellious movement. This is a movement whose ideas are paramount in every sphere of contemporary life. You see it in the advertising world. You hear it from politicians. You see it in popular culture. Everywhere you see this idea that hum humankind is, is a destructive force and nature is at risk from what we do. And you see them lie more and more the more that this goes on. So, for example, Extinction Rebellion at one of its protests in London was handing out a leaflet which said, Africa is on fire. It actually had the sentence, Africa is on fire. That is untrue. That is a lie. It's also a little bit racist, using Africa as this stage upon which white, privileged, middle-class people in London can use to uh, push their argument about how disgusting humankind is. This is where environmentalism ends up when it is protect overprotected from the kind of people we saw during the Battle of Canning Town who want to say to it, the world is not coming to an end. People are not as destructive as you say. You are wrong. You are lying. You are stupid. Any movement, any political ideology which doesn't allow itself to be subjected to that kind of confrontation and discussion will become more and more unhinged. I think the final thing I would say is that 
what we have in the modern environmentalist movement, we've heard that this is an extinction moment. This is a, ser this is a unique moment where humankind could come to an end. We've heard that so many times before. We heard it from Malthus in the late 1700s, early 1800s, when he said there was not enough food to feed humankind and we would all die. It didn't happen. We heard it from eugenicists in the early 20th century who said that the, uh, the wrong people were having children, we were overpopulated, we were all going to die. It didn't happen. We heard it from the panic mongers in the 1980s who talked about acid rain, global cooling, global warming, we were all going to die. We had five years, 10 years, maybe 12 years. It didn't happen. We have to treat these views with skepticism. We have to treat them with cynicism. We have to question them. And the only way we can question them is with the fullest freedom of speech possible. And that is why the environmentalist movement is so singularly hostile to freedom of speech, because they know that their ideology will collapse under the weight of the kind of sensible people we saw in Canning Town. Thank you. No, this, this is not one of those discussions where I now have to quickly think up a question or two to figure out where the differences of opinion um, <laughs> actually lie. So I, I have no need to do that. So I'm glad that I can go straight out to the audience. So a large part of the kind of youth climate movement is that it's causing a lot of anxiety to young people. And then there's like no good news. And it's like all going to be a climate disaster. And as a young person, I get like a lot of anxiety, anxiety from that. And I know a lot of my friends do as well. Um, and I was just wondering, is there like anything positive? Um, I'm asking more kind of my left of the table um, that could like kind of reassure us that yes, this is happening. But there is also like a bright side, like we are actually making progress in terms of um, reducing climate change. OK, picking up on what Brendan was just saying about insulation from discussion. I mean, environmentalists are very keen to talk about the climate crisis, very keen also to discourage any discussion about solutions. So Greta, for instance, says the time for discussion is over. She calls it climate delayerism. But if you look at those dis um, solutions, they're always self-defeating. If you want to, they want to promote public transport, but they protest against the use of land for railways because of the harm to wildlife. They want to cut carbon, but they campaign against nuclear power because of the fears for safety. You know, um, environmentalism undercuts itself. Environmentalism as a philosophy undercuts itself, and it leads to ever narrowing possibilities. Because as a philosophy, it has this negative view of humanity as its heart, as I agree completely with Ashley on that. So I think we do need to switch things around and have like start from a positive view of people and, and what the possibilities might be, discuss the, the possible solutions, then we might get somewhere. Yeah, I, I just like everybody here just to look around you now and point out one thing that isn't made of fossil fuels, was manufactured using fossil fuels, distributed in refrigerated lorries using fossil fuels or tankers or in shops or anything that is not entirely dependent on fossil fuels. Anything. I mean, genuinely, point out anything you can. There's nothing, right? So this idea about net carbon zero is utterly mad. I think that's something we've got to accept. Fossil fuels are absolutely essential for the modern comforts we have in life. And one of the great things that's happening are the developments across the developing world where people are starting to get the standard of living that we are now becoming accustomed to. And we, I think we've got to ask why we've had 30 years of IPCC reports and, uh, and all the stuff about climate change. And over that time, on average, the temperature in the world has gone up about 0 0.15 degree roughly every decade. And it goes up and it goes down, and the world is going through a gradual warming phase. But there's nothing utterly catastrophic apart from the forecasts of the tipping points that never happen. And then they forecast more tipping points that never happen. So I think we've got to ask ourselves why, in the last few years, when nothing dramatic has really changed, it's become the, the political climate has, has massively changed. And I think that's because there is a vacuity of ideas in our institutions. 
So the UN needs a purpose. The EU needs a purpose. Our governments need a purpose. Universities want to have a purpose. Corporations, I mean, even British Petroleum is rebranded as Beyond Petroleum. They've lost sense of confidence in themselves. They just produce oil, all right? You're not a bad person. So th this massive lack of confidence has created a vacuum which is being filled by the greatest cause ever of saving the, of saving the world. It's a huge okay. displacement activity, and it's a massive attack on modernity itself. Great. That was... <laughs> Thank you, Battle of Ideas. If I hadn't been here this afternoon, I wouldn't have believed um, uh, uh, my own ears. Um, one of the reasons I love coming here uh, is that you actually have to see things in, 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 the, in the flesh uh, to believe just uh, the situation we're in. I think, I don't want to misrepresent you, Gregory, uh, you seem like a nice guy. Uh, you look a bit like my dad. You seem a nice, liberal, kind of easygoing, <laughs> kind of guardian reading, mean well sort of chap. I think you listed, um, and uh, correct me, okay? I think basically what you just did is you said, I've got a 10 point plan. And amongst um, one of the ideas which we should live in the underground or in caves or what have you, because it's going to get warm, uh, you slipped in that there are two and a half billion too many people. Um, I just don't know where to start. I mean, apart from which people, old people, brown people, white people, young people, okay? Two and a half billion people, too many. I think it's one of those situations where we really have to go, however well-meaning you are, however nice and decent you seem to be, those sorts of opinions have to be challenged and have to be really questioned. My kids, I've got three kids who are going through the education system, they all get taught about uh, the final solution when there were too many people, and they all get taught about Chairman Mao's uh, The Cultural Revolution. The too many people, right, is a bad idea. Okay? Society is about providing progress and the opportunity. What it would be nice is an extra two and a half billion people, not short of two and a half billion. So are you really saying that you want to organize society going forward so there are fewer of us? And doesn't that just sound like one of the nastiest anti-human uh, uh, concepts and ideas ever raised? Yeah? And then you look at the peers who've raised them and um, much nastier looking fellas, Mao and Hitler, than you. But it's just a disgrace. Uh, I enjoy Brendan's entertaining rhetoric. It rather reminded me of Boris Johnson, actually. Uh, wonderful turn of phrase, but totally lacking in substance. And let me give you one example, your Canning Town revolt. You saw, heard the voice of reason. What was the voice of reason? Not true. That's not the voice of reason. That's a declamation. The problem with people who are too absorbed by political ideas is they ignore evidence. Evidence too often gets forgotten in political debate, and evidence is absolutely important. And to talk about population development, do you not realize that every week, every week, more than one million people extra, that's over the top of people dying, one million people extra coming to the world? You cannot, what, you, think, you think that's great? Uh, well, well, you haven't thought through 20, 30, 40, 50 years, if you think that's true. That's typical of a small-minded response. Let me say something about human nature. There, uh, the, there are th briefly is, as ever, yeah. I want to say something. This is very important. Human nature is complex. First of all, we're biological beings, and we often forget that. And a lot of the dispute, for example, between Brexit and, and Remainers is about in-group, out-group. And it's those things that come from our biology. We're also symbolic creatures. So we assimilate meaning systems, which come from our society. They come from our religions. They come from our cultures, like working class cultures. There's a third aspect of human beings, which is the most important, but it's the most fragile. And that's our ability for reflective thinking. That's what the green movement does. It thinks through what will happen if we keep on doing this. But it's very fragile. Because the strong forces are with biology, our comfort, and they're with our meaning systems that we've assimilated from our society. So I think it's very, very important to listen to the words of the Green Movement. <laughs> well, well, I, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back out, but I'll get some quick reflections from the panel. It's, we often say that there's no way we're going to quite resolve any of these like, <laughs> profound disagreements. <laughs> But one of the things we can do is try and uh, broker a little bit of common understanding. Um, in that vein, uh, Greg, I'll get some of your quick reflections. 
<clears throat> it's quite a lot to go on at once, but I'm glad to know I'm a little better than Hitler anyway. <laughs> So progress, first of all. Yes, we have made uh, considerable progress in sustainable energy, without doubt. And uh, renewables uh, are increasing dramatically, and that's all to the good, but it's not fast enough. We're still marching towards four degrees, even at the rate we're progressing in that area. So the problem of tipping points, why haven't they happened yet? And because they haven't happened, they won't happen at all. Well, this, of course, is rather illogical, to put it mildly. Uh, the tipping points we now anticipate are the melting of ice globally, particularly the Arctic and the Antarctic, but also, of course, glaciers across uh, the north and some in the south. The methane gas, billions of tons of which are trapped under the Siberian tundra, which is melting. Uh, the uh, turning of the Amazon into savanna. Those are the three most important likely tipping points. We know that historically the possibility exists for spikes should any one of these events uh, come to the form that we now understand is possible. 10 degrees possibly spikes a spike in temperature within 10 years and possibly less. So no, they haven't happened yet, but the likelihood is unfortunately rather higher than uh, I would want to hope for. Uh, the, the population question. This has been one of the most vexed taboos for two centuries now. Uh, the world's population passed a billion around 1800 or so. The current estimate is that if aspirationally we imagine that the entire world wants to live as one could reasonably expect they would, at a reasonably middle-class standard of living, we would require about 1.7 planets. So I stand my ground with respect to a slow, rational reduction of population. Stabilization at first, two-child family is a good idea. But do we have the resources to feed the prospective 10 to 15 billion, which are now estimated, if we ever reach 2100, to be the uh, world's population? No, we simply don't. Uh, Greg, I'll, I'll invite everyone, but maybe just a further moment for Greg, in terms of, I mean, one of the reasons we frame this debate, you're, you're free to use your remarks, however you like. One of the reasons we frame this debate in the way we did is that um, I think one of the charges that's come out a little bit from the audience is not necessarily or just around, okay, what facts is going to be, how much warming, what does that mean for these kind of places, or whatever, but how, how can you package or present that in a political program that doesn't seem to, as if the audience maybe not entirely reflected, but that turns, doesn't or doesn't turn people off? Like what, it, how do you create a vision of the future, as the title put it, that doesn't necessarily turn people off? I'll let you reflect on that for a second, but it's just uh, perhaps worth mentioning. Um, uh, Ashley, any thoughts? Yeah, so I, I mentioned misanthropy because misanthropy clouds our understanding of problems. So we immediately look to human behavior um, so it's about we, us, our, you know, it's always we in the abstract, something that we do in our behaviors. And there's this, such a firm conviction that the problems exist because we demand them. It's something within us that it makes it very difficult to think about things in any other way. Um, and, and they'll just say, no, it's the science, it's the science. Yeah, but that, that cultural understanding of human beings and their relationship to problems clouds that. So it's about, you, you gave the example of lining up for iPhones because we demand it. Who here really, really wants their iPhone to have built-in obsolescence? Like, it's, it's, it's perfectly logical to do that, though. So there's a system, I mean, it's it, for a company to build in obsolescence. So it's a, it's a system that, um, that makes it logical to impute, like, planned destruction of things. So capitalism has a destructive side, but it also has an incredibly progressive side. And it seems to me that what we're doing is we're defaulting to that destructive side, saying, well, let's go back. <laughs> and the, But the progressive side of capitalism is how it opened up consumption to the masses, how it opened up the ability to consume to people that had been, up to that point, just con, you know, constrained to certain groups in society, to the feudal lords and so on. The problem is that we don't produce for consumption. If something can't be con uh, bought, then it will rot. And that's, that's really, really wasteful. But the idea of reading Marx as like this anti-consumers, can you really imagine Karl Marx being like, don't covet what the ruling classes have. Be happy with the way things are. Absolutely not. So people will often quote, I've seen the New Economics Foundation quote Marx, and he says, a house may be large or small, but as long as the, the surrounding houses are likewise small, 
it satisfies all requirements for a residence. But let there arise next to the, the house a castle, and the little house shrinks to a hut. And people go, oh, yes, yeah, see, we're never satisfied. He was not saying, be happy with the way things are. He was saying that castle represents what human beings are capable of today. It was built with your labor. It is yours. Go out and take it. Um. So uh, first, I've got a confession to make. I was really, really looking forward to um, sharing a panel with Brendan. And I'm an environmentalist. So... I would just like to address some of his remarks, actually, because I think it's very important. I think, first of all, uh, as per my presence here and in previous years, I think it is imp absolutely imperative that you, environmentalists included, speak to people who strongly disagree with them. That's the point. You've got to be open to challenge, to have your views corrected by those who challenge you, and possibly even to share knowledge with those who may be ignorant over those things which you take them to be ignorant over. So what better way of challenging those people who disagree with you and strongly disagree with you? So coming to the, some of the points that Brendan made, actually, I think you made a number of fallacies. And as a sometime um, analytic philosopher, I could go through them at some length, but let's just take a couple. <coughs> so you talked about you switched from being skeptical to being cynical about environmentalists. Well, skepticism, I can agree with you, because skepticism literally is to do with having a healthy, critical attitude towards anything that's before you, whether it's a matter of belief, whether it's a matter of fact. Science is based on healthy scepticism. So I'm with you on that. Cynicism, why would you want to adopt a negative attitude towards somebody without even hearing what they had to say? So I don't agree with you on that. Also, the fact that, and others in the audience have stated this, that we may have been warned about certain things going to be happening within X number of years and it hasn't happened yet. Well, that, again, that's a fallacy of induction. That's to say, because something hasn't happened in the past, it's not going to happen in the future. But I put it to you that we are at that last generation stage where we have that existential moment. And I put it to you as a psychological challenge that it's going to be very difficult for us to get our heads around that. Because guess what? There's another difficulty in the way we live our lives and the way that we throw stuff away in the way that we overconsume that there's no tomorrow. We are in denial. And it's absolutely the opposite of what the gentleman was saying earlier about the fact that there's some incredible conspiracy theory about the way in which all the organizations and institutions are jumping on the bandwagon because they actually don't care about the climate. At the very least, they care about public attitudes towards the climate, even if they don't really believe in it themselves. But it's not so conspiratorial that they're jumping on the bandwagon because it's good for their business. Or it may be that in addition, but they do care. Some of these people do care. That would be cynical. A um, couple of other points? And just one, please. So, <laughs> Greta, the time for discussion is over. All she really meant, I mean, language context is very important, isn't it? She was simply drawing attention to the fact that we need to act now. And of course, you can debate with climate day deniers. And actually, I would. I'm not one of those who says you shouldn't debate with them because sometimes it's not that they're disagreeing that we're not in a bad way. They're just disagreeing about how we got there. They might have some debates to be had about whether it's just part of the Earth cycle but they don't actually disagree on the fact that something has to be done about it. Great, thanks, Sharon. Uh, Brendan. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting that you mentioned science and the role of skepticism in science, because I think one of the worst things that environmentalism, the ideology of environmentalism has done, has been to corrupt science. Uh, and in fact, increasingly now, environmentalists refer to the science. They treat it as this kind of gospel truth Greta Thunberg marches behind the banner of listen to the science. I've seen people march in London on climate ch change demos say, with huge placards saying, listen to the science, the science has spoken. Uh, and basically it's a call to obey the science. Now that's both illiberal because it's basically saying you cannot be skeptical because the word of God in its modern, modern incarnation, i.e. the science has spoken. It's also bad for science because it invites this increasing politicization of what ought to be an open-ended, falsifiable, questioning approach to uh, 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 human life and natural life. So I think environmentalism, part of the process of cushioning it and insulating it from public rebuke and, and open, honest discussion, you are rare among Greens if you are interested in debate, um, is that it has corrupted science as well as political discussion. But just one quick point, the idea that us pointing out that things that were predicted in the past haven't happened is a fallacy 
is itself a fallacy. Because the question is why those predictions were wrong. Not simply the fact that they were wrong, but why they were wrong. So if you look at Malthus, for example, who was, in, a, in, in essence, an environmentalist. He was a population panic monger, late 1700s, early 1800s. There were 980 million human beings on Earth at the time that Malthus was writing. And he said, we were going to run out of food, we were going to run out of space to live, and death will visit mankind. He was wrong. For example, today in, Chi in Chi hold on, in China, in China alone today, there are more people than that. There are 1.4 billion people. And uh, life expectancy in China has risen from uh, about 36 in 1949 to around 75 today. China used to have around 150 cities. Now it has more than 650. And uh, 235 million Chinese people have been lifted out of absolute poverty over the past few decades. So Malthus was wrong. Why was he wrong? He was wrong because, for the same reason that environmentalists are wrong. Because they treat population growth and our use of resources as the only variable and everything else as fixed, including human ingenuity. They see human ingenuity as fixed, as firm, as immovable. And therefore, their maths are simply incorrect. Malthus didn't see the Industrial Re Revolution coming, so he was wrong. The early 20th century eugenicists didn't see the Green Revolution coming, therefore they were wrong. The uh, environmentalists today don't see or don't care about the potential of a nuclear revolution, and therefore they are wrong. This much uranium could power your whole life from birth to death literally this much uranium. It is so obvious to so many of us that the exploitation by man of uranium is the solution not only to environmental problems but to the future itself. Greens are opposed to it because they are driven fundamentally by misanthropy rather than by a desire to really progress yeah. humankind. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, there's quite quite a lot of hands. We're going to try and get everyone in, but it'll mean everybody being as snappy as possible. Um, yeah, well, I'll try and be as quick as I can. I, I was just going to say that I think um, it strikes me when looking at environmentalism, a lot of environmentalists, particularly Extinction Rebellion, try and paint themselves as a kind of radical movement, often as a kind of left-wing movement. And there's a lot of overlap with the sort of communism and things like that. Um, but it's, it's just odd to me because it doesn't seem like there's anything really that radical about it or if there is something radical about it it's a kind of radical conservatism mm -hmm. um previously the left would talk about optimism and about conquering nature and um, making nature it's something into which something you know mankind could could kind of live off and dominate today we're talking about population control um, ending indulgence which by the way i don't think we're living all in indulgence i think that's just something in the west um and austerity, these things which are sort of the great behemoths of right-wing or even far right-wing uh, movements. So it seems to me that actually a lot of environmentalism, even if there's a good cause behind it, is becoming about control rather than freedom. And surely that's the opposite of what should be radical. Yeah, sure. Okay. There was a talk yesterday where it suggested that the scientists were part of the establishment. And today there was a, another talk suggesting that um, generally people didn't trust society okay <clears throat> now we're going to talk about china very briefly uh, at the moment china generates about 30 percent of all co2 gases in the world they produce uh, they process five million tons of coal every year they are just about to bring online over the next few years another 1100 power stations each of which is going to use about a million tons of coal are China entitled to give their poor a way of life that we have? Hi, can I ask the panel about the Avengers and is Gregory <laughs> Thanos? I'd, uh, I'd just like to pick up on um, Brendan's point um, regarding the science, and, and this is directed at uh, uh, Dr. Ali quite specifically. You mentioned, you made the claim, you, you obviously welcome challenge, you made the claim that environmentalists are, are objective. Well, What's the scientific consensus surrounding nuclear power, like Brendan mentioned, and around GM technology, for example? Um, Greta Thunberg recently said, recently tweeted, personally, I'm against nuclear. Uh, and said something about it being the most dangerous form of energy, which is scientifically untrue. It's actually the safest 
one or one of the safest forms of energy. Uh, and the consensus is clear on this. I think it's around 67% of climate scientists agree that nuclear is integral to uh, any future um, energy plan. And yet neither of you, you guys have mentioned that. You've not a, a single mention of it. In fact, your party, the Green Party, for many years, I don't know what its current stance is, was actively against GMO technology, despite the overwhelming scientific consensus surrounding that subject. So I would point specifically to say the likes of France and Sweden that have pretty much decarbonized their entire grids using nuclear in the space of 20, 30 years. And uh, so my can point right. is that really. I'm a bit disturbed by the message of Extinction Rebellion because we know advertising and change happens through emotions. So the, the words are, uh, do as I say, not what I do. Uh, you have celebrities deeming that what they do is so important they're allowed to fly planes because, of course, making movies is so much more important than um, all the work the little people do. But uh, the disempowering message says that as little people, we can do nothing. So we have to look towards a parent or an authority to enact change. And the elephant in the room is, what about thorium? Thorium, as some people may know, is safe nuclear energy that was developed in the 1940s and the 1950s by the US government, who dropped it because you couldn't weaponize it. It's of a magnitude safer than plutonium. It's, um, it's more prevalent than plutonium. And it, it's, it's right here. So the Extinction Rebellion emphasis seems to be uh, against, well, well the, the most valuable resource we have is human ingenuity and innovation. So there's a few more Einsteins that could be living amongst the three billion that are still in poverty. Why do you want to suppress human ingen ingenuity and drive humanity back to the Stone Age and suppress these people, their chance to um, be Einsteins. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I, uh, well, I just wanted to take issue with Dr. Is it Dr. Ali on your um, admonishment of Brendan for being both cynical and skeptical. I think cynicism is an a very important component of the debate. I had the dubious pleasure of being a member of the European Parliament. And um, uh, which has led me to be extremely cynical about, well, in fact, I was cynical about the organization before I got there. But what they do do in the European Parliament is grandstand a great deal about environmental issues. The Greens are very pro-EU, the Liberal Democrats are very pro-EU, and they use that forum to grandstand on behalf of environmentalism. But the single most damaging policy that the European Union has for the environment is the common agricultural policy. Three billion of which comes to this country, three billion of which serves to keep food prices high, to damage the environment, um, to keep food prices up. And therefore, you have to be cynical in this debate. Grandstanding and supporting environmental issues when actually through the back door, you're promoting all these anti-environmental agendas needs to be taken to task. So I think Brendan is absolutely right to be both skeptical and cynical. Thank you. So Ashley spoke briefly about the human races um, not being progressive anymore and kind of ruling back. And um, that led me to think that surely isn't there a case to be made that the human race has perhaps progressed too quickly, too far. And this ruling back is simply an attempt of humans to create an equ equilibrium again and to kind of go back to a, a normal base state from which we can carry on to progress again. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on that. I'm actually worried about the Extinction Re Re Rebellion rebels, and that's as a green. My, my view is that the whole, um, so, the whole nature of the protest is so enormous, it's like to, likely to create burnout for these people, uh, many of whom could in future actually help our society uh, develop its way out of these problems that we all face. The, uh, there, there, is, there has been, over the past three and a half years, uh, cases of Brexit psychosis. Um, and people have actually been sectioned as a result. I, I, I can't imagine that won't happen if Extinction Rebellion carries on at the pitch that it is uh, in, in, for the next few years. 
It's just too enormous a problem. The problems are too intractable for, for protesters acting in small groups to sort out immediately. The, uh, uh, the problems are frequently international and they'll often involve uh, 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 countries such as Af African countries, uh, Asia, um, that yeah. are relatively uh, poor. They're going to become disillusioned. And okay. therefore, my concern is that they get other places to learn how to do <coughs> politics properly okay. with more community politics, more debates like this one, and ideally more trade unionism. One very quick one. I listen to all these arguments and all these discussions. They all seem to be very Western orientated and ignore the fact that more than half the world lives in poverty and actually wants what we have. And we have to address that before we can ignore it. I, I do think it's disgusting that primary school age children have been encouraged to go out and protest um, uh, with, with the climate change um, and, and often with quite frightening uh, material that they possibly take literally like the Africa was on fire and not realise there's maybe a, a figurative element to that. Um, and I, I'm always very grateful to my parents' generation who shielded us from the, the quite prescient threat, actually, of, of nuclear strikes in the Cold War. I mean, that was a threat in the 1980s that was actually, well, it was quite real. Um, but but they, they tried to shield us from it, and I think it was a good thing. Okay, so I think great. there's a problem with the way that works. Uh, actually, to be honest, um, the idea that human world's gonna come to an end isn't new. Uh, as an archeologist, I know then South America and China, the idea of cyclical temporality instead of a linear temporality is quite, per, um, prominent. So the idea that Western, you know, the linear progression to the end, I think is an unhealthy mentality. Quite often in those times, people would think that, oh, this is going to end. But human and nature will both rise again to have another cyclical temporality. So I think we need to have that mentality instead. Hands across the barricade to start with. Uh, Dr. Ali was at my session and he agreed with me, so I like him. Uh, I had a drink with him last <laughs> night and he quoted John Stuart Mill, so I liked him some more. Uh, so two questions to yourself. You can uh, have one. Uh, uh, well, they're, they're both very similar. So the first one, um, Hans Rosling does it. I think it's Hans Rosling. Does a, a, he's in a group like this, and he asks people. And it's, they're all media types, and he says, uh, "Has has poverty got better or worse, Baba, in the last hundred years? Has death from climate change got better or, or worse in the last hundred years? How, how much education do women have?" And all the nice liberal people get all the answers wrong and have the most pessimistic answers imaginable. Do you accept that we live in a climate where we are pessimistic and do not see the benefits from industrialization? There was a, there was a young girl get down here who was looking for inspiration from the left-hand side of the panel. Good luck with that. But I, I would go more on the right-hand side. When I was 10 years old, there was a thing called the, the uh, hole in the ozone layer. I don't know if anyone remembers that. And they said, ah, oh, well, you know, we're going to all die from that. And there was a, uh, the cause of that was chlorofluorocarbons, I do remember, and they were found in refrigerators. Guess what the solution was? No, it wasn't get rid of refrigerators. It was replace the cooling element with something that wasn't chlorofluorocarbons. That is a technological solution to an environmental problem. Uh, I just wanted to point out something that I felt, Gregory, you did. Uh, the gentleman here touched on it, and I think the gentleman here touched on it a little. It, it's something that you see environmentalists do all the time. They give the problem, or at least their idea of the problem, and then they immediately sort of shoo in behind it, along with their other ideas, their own sort of economic policy prescriptions. It's generally something like, uh, well, we need, to stop uh, we need to stop the environment from going to shit. So the first thing we need to do is get rid of capitalism. And to me, that makes no sense. I find that highly disingenuous. Thank you. Well, but uh, Gregory, your final thoughts. Right, so there's a lot here. Uh, Extinction Rebellion is not full of misanthropists. Uh, I've been on the barricades with them on the, both of the great occasions in London. Uh, these are people who have a very deep feeling for humanity and who are willing to sacrifice even at the risk of their own arrest, their own freedom, their time, their resources, in order to give you a future. So let's not talk about misanthropy, okay? Science is pretty much unanimous, except for a few organizations, Murdoch and co, uh, who offer a lot of disingenuous climate denial information. Once you exclude this, the science is pretty well unanimous on the course of action. It's not rocket science, but it is a, a very dire future we face, according to the vast majority. Nuclear power, sorry, Chernobyl and Fukushima. I'm going with wind and solar. Uh, last, last, last point, okay, get, get rid of capitalism. 
I don't think I expressed it exactly that way, but yes, we are moving towards a very different form of social and economic organization. All right, thanks. We'll, we'll have an applause at the end for everyone, so there's literally not enough time. Ashley. Yeah, they don't actually say get rid of capitalism. They don't, they don't say that, unless they, they equate capitalism with consumption. That's what they mean. But, that's, but capitalism isn't just consumption. Um, so I don't know what the solution is, and I don't say that we should get rid of capitalism. I, I have uh, my eyes on human freedom as the, as the goal. Can, how do we organize things to free up human beings from toil? And if, if capitalism can deliver on that, then I'm all for it. I, I think that it has a very destructive side, and I think actually a lot of what we're seeing here is that destructive side. And, and it's, um, you mentioned like progress, it, progress too quickly. You know, maybe we progress too quickly. Well, that's interesting because that is exactly what the romantic reaction to the Enlightenment said. We, they look back on the past with this mourning and they, they saw it, the Industrial Revolution and they want to go back to what was lost and so on. And this is why C Marx called uh, romantic anti-capitalism capitalism's legitimate antithesis. That is, it is its ironic sustaining ideology because it looks at that progressive force that opens up human beings to consumption and brings human beings together and creates a, a basis for human freedom, but it, it always looks back to the past and, and, it, and in, in that way it ironically sustains the present and, and asks people to hold back against the its uh, productive side. Thank you very much. Uh, over to Sharon. Uh, three quick points. Firstly, I should uh, address the gentleman who's asking about uh, GM and nuclear power. I would say, generally speaking, that our position uh, in the party and everybody who looks at this should be empirical, not ideological. That is to say that it's a question of risk assessment, and the science comes in at the precautionary principle. As with GM, are the risks inherent in irreversible changes to the environment uh, worth uh, or are there alternative ways of doing it in terms of sustainable food agriculture? Same with nuclear power. Some environmentalists like James Lovelock does advocate nuclear power with a heavy heart because he wants to buy time. But if you look at the accidents, Chernobyl is one, you can see how horrendous the legacy is, is upon future generations. And that's what actually what um, conditions our responses to those two. Um, in terms of cynicism, okay, so maybe I should have said unjustified cynicism, begging the question somewhat, isn't healthy. It can be healthy, but not as an initial predisposition towards somebody in a debate. And you could have justified cynicism when, when for example, politicians serially uh, break their promises. Uh, finally, uh, coming back to a very earlier point about positive views of people, I think it's environmentalists, ultimately, who have the most positive view of people. They are so positive about the beautiful world that we inherit. And they're so positive about human ingenuity that they want to be able to save and rescue us from our own excesses, including those um, youth who went to, who, who striked from school because they wanted to raise the alarm. So we should applaud them, Thank not you. condemn them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Brendan, briefly as possible. I just find it staggering that we're talking about progressing too quickly and having too much stuff at a time when three billion people live in dire poverty and literally don't have enough food to eat and literally die of diseases that we have long since conquered in this country. So I, for one, I'm sick and tired of really quite plummy, privileged, uh, usually white young people taking to the streets of London and calling for an end to economic growth with not a second thought for the billions of usually non-white people who would love a bit of that economic growth. So I'm not saying we should criticize environmentalism. I'm not saying we should be cynical about it. I'm not saying we, we should be skeptical about it. We should oppose it. It is a barrier to human progress. It is a barrier to the liberation of humankind from poverty. Environmentalism is the ideology through which poverty is currently justified, and we should stand up against it all the time. Right, we thank, uh, thank the whole panel as well. Thank you.